welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to update everyone on our schedule for next month. We have a very busy month. On top of uh, what's going over, going on across the street at the State House, it makes for a very interesting time. Um, but I wanted to let folks know that our schedule is posted online on our website. But for um, a review here, uh, I will let you know that on Tuesday, February 4th, we have a data governance council meeting that is located in this building on the fourth floor in the conference room. And then on Wednesday, February 5th, we have our regularly scheduled board meeting in this room. And we have quite a few things on the agenda. We have the Act 53 HIE consent implement implementation potential vote. You heard about that last week. We have the um, vital FY 2020 budget adjustment and potential vote, which you've also heard about last week. And then you'll also have a non-standard QHP qualified health plan design approval process in 2021 evaluation criteria potential vote, which you'll hear about today. And then last but not least, you'll hear One Care Vermont's Need Primary Prevention Program and Overview of Rise Vermont Expansion and Outcomes Measurement. So it looks like a lot of paper, but it's three votes and then one presentation. And then on Monday, February, 20, February 10th, we have a general advisory committee meeting, and that is located on in that same room here in um, this building, but on the fourth floor again in the conference room. And then on Wednesday, February 12th, we will hear standard qualified health plan designs presentation. On Wednesday, February 19th, we're going to hear from University of Vermont Medical Center milestone report on investments towards increasing mental health capacity. And then we'll also hear the standard QHP designs discussion. And um, actually, that's a potential vote. We'll have heard it the week before. And then for the last item uh, on our next month's agenda is on Wednesday, February 26th, we'll hear the hospital operating performance FY19 year-end report. So for a short month, <laughs> we've packed it in. There's a lot going on. Um, and I just recommend you consult our website for those meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, January 22nd. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 22nd without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So now we're going to turn it over to um, Amarin, Dana, and Emily. We're going to talk about non-standard QHP. Good afternoon. My name is Amber Navratili, Associate General Counsel at the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm here with Dana Houlihan, the Director of Plan Management and Enrollment Policy at the Department of Vermont Health Access, and Emily Brown, Director of Rates and Forms at the Department of Financial Regulation. So today, we are going to talk about non-standard qualified health plan approval process as well as evaluation criteria that the board may use for evaluating 2021 non-standard qualified health plans. <coughs> Before we get into the process <coughs> itself, I asked Dana if he could provide a little more information about what non-standard qualified health plans are and um, how we got here today. So I am going to turn it over to Dana. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this may be well known by many, but for any any of us in the room who are less familiar with the distinction between standard and the non-standard plans, is that um, the simple answer is that standard plans are offer the same cost share benefit amounts for their plans um, between the issuers. So the in Vermont, the Blue Cross Blue Shield standard platinum plan has the same benefits in terms of cost share amounts as the MVP platinum plan, for example. Um, rates are different, but the benefits are the same. Uh, in the non-standard plans, those that's an area where the issuer has some uh, choice, where they can alter 
certain benefits still within the appropriate actuarial value ranges, but um, it allows for the issuers to respond to a, a demand they're hearing in the small business community, for example, for businesses that they work with or, in, or from the individual market, things they're hearing elsewhere in the industry that they want to consider um, in one of their plans. And as I said, the benefits, although they need to conform to the compliant actuarial value ranges, the benefit configurations themselves can be different among the issuers. So um, since the inception of Vermont's exchange, we've had both standard and non-standard plans. Um, we have an expectation that that will continue. And today we're here to um, get more definition around the approval process and criteria for um, the non-standard benefit designs. I work very closely with a stakeholder group, uh, including the issuers and other stakeholders, um, to, to present to this board every year the standard plan designs that we propose. And um, that same structure is, doesn't make as much sense on the non-standard side because the issuers themselves want to um, make the, um, you know, introduce an innovation or an idea that they um, think will be popular in the market and um, so it wouldn't, you know, it just doesn't fit within a, a, a stakeholder group the way the, in the same way that the uh, standard plans do. And actually our issuers have both asked for more clarity around the process for non-standard uh, plan approval. So um, we've come together to do this. As, uh, as Amron said, so I think at this point I can turn it back to Amron for, uh, for more detail around how the uh, proposed process was developed. Thanks, Dana. I also just wanted to clarify one item. When we talk about benefits in this context, we're talking about the cost sharing structure um, and less so what coverage the policy itself provides. So um, this process is entirely focused on cost sharing deductibles, out-of-pocket maximums, um, and does not cover what services is or, or is not covered under a particular plan. Um, so, talking about how we um, developed this process and the considerations that we took into account as we um, tried to come up with a process that would work both for the regulators as well as for the carriers and for the public. Some of the things that we kept in mind was that this really is an area for carrier innovation. So we wanted a process that would provide an annual opportunity if carriers wished to update their plan designs or offer a different plan. And the idea behind this was allowing uh, carriers, as Dana mentioned, to really tailor their cost sharing plan designs to the priorities and needs of their particular membership. Another main consideration for us as regulators was to make sure that whatever process we come up with is going to work for all of the regulators, both the Remount Care Board, DFR, and DEVA, as we have a, um, a process for certification that is one of the handouts uh, that you received today. So we wanted to make sure that this process fell in line with that process and that we weren't creating any uh, barriers to things moving forward as they normally do from year to year. Another uh, consideration was transparency in the process. One of the tricky things about the non-standard plan designs is that these are particular to each carrier, so they want to be able to develop these um, in a way where their plans remain competitive um, and that proprietary information is kept proprietary. Uh, so we wanted to reflect those concerns from the carriers, but we also wanted to still allow for some sort of public process and public presentation of these designs. And then lastly, we were looking um, at this process with an eye towards ensuring minimal disruption to policyholders. And uh, this process, as we were developing it, uh, includes a time for carriers to discuss with DIVA and DFR uh, potential issues that might come up with their standard plans, either in terms of forms or in terms of certification, and allow things, um, allows for conversations like how you're going to uh, plan map uh, members who are going to be moving out of a plan that's sunsetting into a new plan 
to ensure that there is, that is a relatively streamlined process and that there is not disruption uh, to the consumer. Thank you. I wanted to have this slide in here just to highlight all of the areas that the three regulating entities have during this process. Um, I won't go through them in detail, but they are here. Um, if you would like to review them. Uh, in this instance, what we're really talking about is the first bullet point for the Green Mountain Care Board, which is reviewing and approving qualified health plan designs. And so uh, our focus today is on that, but I just wanted to give you the broader context of how many regulatory processes are moving through uh, getting qualified health plans on the exchange. I've included three slides that have a higher simplified, uh, sorry, higher level simplified version of the process that you have also as a handout. Um, so I will just briefly walk through each of the steps. So roughly a year prior to form filing, the board has the opportunity to update the criteria it will use to evaluate whether a non-standard plan design adds value to the Vermont market. Prior to form filing, which typically happens in March, issuers need to notify DIVA of any modifications to non-standard plans or any new proposed plan designs. Following that notification, DFR and DIVA may meet with issuers to work through potential form filing or certification concerns. And in the event that the issuer is proposing to sunset a current plan, the issuer must provide DFR and DIVA with a preliminary plan for mapping current enrollees into a new plan during open enrollment. Number five is sort of a big one for the purposes of the board review. There is a, uh, there, we are setting a threshold for what plan design changes will come before the board. Um, and what we discussed and have included in here is that if carriers wish to do uh, changes that are considered uniform modifications under federal regulations, then those plan designs would not need to come before the board for approval. This is similar to the standard plan design um, process that the board does where the carriers also, where the board's approval is not required for uniform modification, modification changes to a plan design. Next, um, issuers will present the designs that require board approval to the board no later than April 15th. And in it, another important note for carriers is that the plan and all of the plan design conversations that are happening between carriers and DFR and DIVA prior to form filing will be considered confidential um, so that carriers can feel free to develop their plans without concern that they're going to lose a competitive advantage. <clears throat> Once issuers come before the board, they must demonstrate the value of the proposed plan or plan changes. And as part of what we're looking at today, the board will use evaluation criteria to evaluate the value of these plans, evaluate the value, <laughs> <laughs> determine the value of these plans. And, uh, and then we put in there that issuers will have 30 days notice of when they need to present any non-standard plan design changes. So once the board has um, reviewed the plan designs, there are two options. The board can approve the plan designs or the board can decide not to approve a plan design if it determines that the plan design will not add value to the Vermont marketplace. If the board decides to not approve a proposal, the issuer may request that the board reconsider its decision, and they have 10 days to request that reconsideration, or they may refile forms for its current non-standard plan design, or that current non-standard plan design with minor changes that don't exceed a uniform modification. <clears throat> and just Towards the end, we just wanted to make sure that everyone is clear that the board's approval of a non-standard plan design does not mean that DFR will approve the forms or that DIVA will certify the plan. This is strictly for the board to determine whether the plan would add value to the Vermont market, assuming 
that it meets all other requirements under state law. So that is all I have for the process. Um, I think, I, unless there are any questions that anyone has right now, I'll move over to the evaluation criteria and then take questions at the end. But I will defer to the chair on that. I, I do have a question related to the uniform modification uh, requirement. Um, and I don't, you don't need to answer this right now, but it would be helpful to get a little more detail about what that sort of means in terms of how significant a, ch a plan change that would be. And the other question I would ask you to think about a little bit is if there were something, so this kind of goes to the evaluation criteria, but if, for example, we were, were picking a plan uh, because we felt like it met uh, an evaluation criteria of an innovation in the market, so let's say a wellness plan, for example, uh, I think there, I personally wouldn't want the carrier to necessarily then take away that part that made it special, even if it was within that uniform uh, modification level. So um, I'm sorry I didn't think about this prior to today or I would have given you more of a heads up about it, but if you could think a little bit about that um, over the next week or so. I mean, you're welcome to yeah. answer that. Yeah. Well, I don't want to put I, you on the spot. I could just tell you, you know, uh, I'm Emily Brown from DFR. Um, last year when we were going through the review process for the non-standard plans, um, an issue arose where we ha had a plan submitted that we didn't view as a uniform modification. And when we were deciding whether it was, usually a uniform modification is a change that's made to um, uh, comply with the AD value of a plan. So your cost share last year was a $1,200 deductible and uh, based on the new AB calculator, you need to adjust that to 1300. That would be a plan design change that would have been done so that your plan could still stay at the level it was. Yep. Um, so an example of something that we would view as a non-uniform modification, and I think is viewed at the federal level as a non-uniform modification, would be a change that was made um, uh, to a cost share structure. So you had a plan that was mainly um, uh, uh, imposing a cost share through deductibles, and then you switch to um, a plan that is uh, imposing a cost share through co-insurance mechanisms. So that would be something that would be we would view as a, a design change and not just modification to stay within um, an AD yeah. range. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. That seems broad enough to be my example. <laughs> Okay, to move on to the evaluation side. Or? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so a couple of things about the evaluation criteria before we look at the criteria itself. Uh, at present, the board does not have criteria. So if carriers were to, um, well, let me read my slides because I'm <laughs> up very nicely here. So. Um, this proposed criteria would apply to non-standard plan design proposals presented to the board for the 2021 plan year um, or after that year. Carriers are presently developing their 2021 plan designs. If plan designs require board approval, carriers would present their designs to the board this spring. This criteria, if adopted, will be used in the board's determination of whether a proposed non-standard plan design will add value to the marketplace. As I have mentioned before, DFR and DVA will remain responsible for determining whether plan designs meet federal and state requirements for qualified health plans offered on the exchange. So some of the things we considered when um, proposing this criteria, we thought that the criteria should provide metrics for the board to assess the value of a proposed plan design um, in whether it would add value to the Vermont marketplace. We also wanted to make sure that the criteria were specific enough to provide guidance to carriers on how they might demonstrate evidence of value. As non-standard plan designs are an area for carrier innovation, the criteria need to be specific enough to allow for meaningful board review, but also broad enough to not inhibit carrier innovation. At present, there are no criteria in place, and one of the reasons we wanted to have to propose criteria is that if 
uh, carriers decide that they do want to propose something beyond uniform modifications for the 2021 plan year, we wanted the board to have uh, criteria that will provide structure for the board to review. So the, and I think I mentioned earlier, the form filings for 2021 plans are due in March, um, which is why we are proposing this now to make sure that uh, carriers have a little bit of time before their forms are filed to consider the criteria. The criteria that we are proposing are first, a substantial difference in deductible and or maximum out of pocket compared to standard plans. Substantial cost share difference for one or more highly utilized services compared to standard plan designs. Plan structure difference compared to standard plan designs. Enhancing innovation or adding value to the Vermont individual and small business health insurance market. As I said, these are fairly broad, um, but given that carriers are already um, a good ways into designing their plans for 2021, we wanted to make sure that for this year we weren't boxing any of the carriers in um, and that the board would still be able to also have something to look at when we're reviewing uh, plan designs this spring. So the next steps for both the process and the criteria, we have open day public comment period that runs through February 3rd. And right now the board is scheduled for a discussion and potential vote uh, next Wednesday on the 5th. managed 
so that we don't kind of wander into a situation where, where we're spending beyond our means and the ultimate, um, uh, to the ultimate detriment of, of, of people out there who need insurance and are just finding it more and more unaffordable. So I think that's a really good point. And uh, the feedback we've received from the carers is that they want to innovate or create new product designs to try to attract um, new people to the marketplace. So, um, you know, to speak to a plan that was submitted last year, I believe it was uh, submitted, the design was proposed to try to attract small groups that actually had left the market for um, the association health plans and to try to get them to come back um, with a design that looked very similar to those plans. Um, so that would be a way that um, by innovating and leveraging the Green Mountain Care Board a process for looking at what the value is to the market, I think that could be um, that could be a plan or an idea that could essentially help premiums, you know, by the, the subsidization of um, the individuals by the small groups. So I think that would be an example. So, um, and I guess, so as, as you go through this process, the other kind of, in terms of the, uh, the QHP population, there's really two markets. There's the non-standard market and the standard market. Um, do, do, is there a process by which, or are you aware that the insurers themselves are kind of looking at these stovepipe books, book of businesses and trying to sort out which ones um, are the most cost effective and which ones aren't? Because um, I'm just wondering if there's you know, what the if there is any cross subsidization going on between the standard plans and the non-standard plans yeah. uh, that that we're it's just invisible to us now, but maybe shouldn't be. That's a good question, and I'm, I'm not personally aware. I don't know, but that would be a great question to put in the issuers. Yeah, I would agree that the issuers have the most control or um, a, a set of information needed to. Uh, to weigh the value of adding an innovation to a plan that's going to attract membership, which we, they want, we all want, and also um, not have an effect on premium that um, you know, would serve to hurt that. I think the you know, we all have to remember that the um, federal AV calculator applies to both the standard and non-standard, and they're very strict guidelines, so that. Um, an issuer wouldn't be able to uh, take away any kind of a benefit that would drop or raise a, uh, an AV value to bring it out of the, those very tight ranges. So um, the innovations in plan design are very important, but the AV restrictions still apply, and the issuers have uh, their own way of predicting the premium, the likely premium impact um, based on a tweet just as we try to do that for the standard plan designs applying to both um, maybe using some different methodology but trying to look at least what the directional impact would be of making this change or that change so a lot of factors it's, it's a really good question but it's difficult to get our arms around all of it <laughs> with this so, I'm just wondering one more question on, on, on this issue that as time goes on um, and we go through the rate review process, um, the actuaries are predicting um, uh, these loss ratios. Um, and then if you look at the actual track record now in the review mirror, they haven't done a very good job. And that can that be the, the plans have lost more money um, or cost more premiums than they expected. And I'm just wondering, you know, who's responsible for that after it happens? Does it come, does it come to the board and, and we have to raise, you know, uh, uh, raise rates or should we be, um, because the insurer is saying, you know, we have a solvency problem or should we be saying to the insurer, the solvency problem is your problem and it goes all the way back to plan design and to, you know, the pricing of the plan and that's an issue that you have to solve, uh, insurer. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what the answer is to that, but. Uh, I, I just feel that's, that some of this is getting falling um, between the cracks. The other issue I want to talk about a little bit is about the benchmark plan. And I know that the 2021 benchmark plan is what it is. Um, I'm not an expert in this area. My understanding is the benchmark plan that we have 
goes back to 2014, uh, which predates the um, all care model and a lot of the kind of current reform efforts uh, that, that were in, in, engaged here in Vermont. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, and the one that sticks out to me the most is uh, pre-diabetic prevention in that uh, you can go to the doctor <coughs> and the doctor can say, you know, your, your numbers are getting a little high, high there, you're pre-diabetic, and before you get to be a diabetic, it's better to get you on a different track. And what is the best recommendation for that? Well, it's nutrition and, and physical fitness, and the Blueprint does have a program for that um, that is, you know, um, barely funded, but it, but it is, it is out there in some um, hospital service areas. So, but there's nothing in the benchmark plan that, um, that offers uh, an individual the, the right solution, the CDC um, um, diabetic um, prevention program. And so I'm just wondering if for the 2022 process, should we be looking to revisit the benchmark plan to make sure it is as efficiently and, and maximum, maximally aligned with our other goals uh, in healthcare in terms of the all care model. Um, it's, you know, if you look at Blue Cross Blue Shield's marketing information, they say that once you kind of cross the diabetic threshold, um, it's about 7,400 bucks a year uh, in terms of the plan that they have to, to, to manage that. Um, and from what I understand and what I, I can see in the blueprint, it's a few hundred dollars a year uh, to have people engaged in a nutrition and fitness program. And so it, it just seems to me we're uh, being penny wise and pound foolish here in some ways and that maybe um, it's time to open up the benchmark plan. Um, I understand from those that have done before me that it could be a bit of a food fight uh, it could be a bit of a food fight because everybody's, you know, once you open that door, a lot of people want to rush through it. So if maybe, you know, if the board were to recommend that we, we look to op reopen it for the 2022 process, but only do it for purposes of, of alignment with um, the all care model and not ear, you know, hearing aids and all these other things that people would try to squeeze in, is that something that would make sense to you? I think that's a really good um, thought and um, I think going back to the innovation piece I think you know when whenever I go to the NAIC the national meetings um, on insurance uh, a lot of the issuers in the community are talking about management of chronic illnesses and diabetes um, so I could see also that the innovation maybe it's not through the state setting a standard for the benchmark, but maybe an ask of carriers to try to innovate, to create through utilization management or another technique, um, a process whereby they could adopt some of the, the state goals in, into the non-standard plans and maybe effectuate it that way. Um, I, I can't really speak to whether opening up the benchmark would be a good idea or not, not knowing what the you know, the proposal would be for that. But I could see the innovation, um, the, the carriers coming up with an innovative way to try to approach that would also um, potentially be a good idea. Well, it just seems to me that we might be stuck with a benchmark plan that's getting a little old. Yeah. And it might yeah. be time to revisit it. Yeah. Because a lot has happened since 2014. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, other questions? Jess? Yeah, I actually, it would start somewhat related to what um, Tom was saying, I'm wondering, any consideration go towards adding a criterion here that just basically says something like uh, plan design should support current health reform efforts in the state. I mean, it, we may not have all payer model, you know, but just current health reform efforts in the state, and then that's an, a criterion we might consider. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> I think we could interpret the enhances innovation as being inclusive of that. Maybe. But I think being more specific than yeah, it's more yeah, it's the state. Because innovation yeah. can be defined lots of ways. Sure. So I don't know. It's just a thought. Uh, all I'm saying is I wouldn't have it be a separate criteria. I would be clarifying for that criteria. Otherwise, your innovation versus healthcare reform. Mm -hmm. So maybe adding priority around four. Yeah, right. that would be my suggestion. Yeah. That's fine by me. Well, let me add, I don't 
know that we've actually talked about this amongst ourselves explicitly, but I thought of the criteria in a way that one plan proposal might tick off several of those boxes. So you could consider something both innovating as well as, um, I guess what I'm saying is that I think you could have them separate if you would like, or one can clarify the other. Um, and we could have those as two proposals for next week for board discussion, if that would be of interest to board members. Okay, I will do that. Any other questions from the board? I, I don't have a question, but I have a clarification, although I don't want to do it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to quibble with there, at present, there are no criteria in place. Having been the person sitting in your seat getting the previous criteria approved by the board. <laughs> um, so from my perspective, there were criteria that were approved through a process using an RFP that Viva issued and that absent those criteria being revoked, that those are still in place. So that's a legal quibble, but I think it's, for me, it sort of sets the record straight in terms of the fact that it's not like there wasn't a previous process that was followed. That is correct. I misworked with that in my slides. Okay. You know, I, I, I think it's an important quibble. thing to uh, point out and also. Is that a legal term? Uh, <laughs> well, we did reference them as well. Yeah, and you. <laughs> um, and actually, that is where that prior approved set of criteria is these criteria? Yeah. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. That, yes, I should not have worded it that way. It's okay. That's it. Okay, That's my question. <laughs> anyone? If not, we'll open it up to the public for comment. Yes, Walter. I just uh, I kind of want to back up something that uh, Tom said and then go a little further with it. Um, I'm curious what in plain English or plain language the phrase adding value to the Vermont marketplace means. And to follow up for who, value for who, because everyone knows that the idea of a marketplace is positive cash flow to enhance that. And you do that through plain denials and through the cost sharing. And more and more Americans cannot afford or more and more Americans with health insurance cannot afford the access to health care because of these cost sharing that are forced on them by plans like these. So I'm curious what adding value to the Vermont marketplace actually needs. And for who? Because it's not us. Well, it does say to the Vermont individual and small business health insurance market. Well, I can tell you what I was thinking about when the first time around in 2012 on that. And the, uh, the, so the idea is that if a carrier, so again, this is within the small contained world of cost sharing and deductibles, which as Dana mentioned, are largely driven by the federal law. So the federal law requires the AD levels, with, which by your definition, quite frankly, would be including some unaffordable plans with very high cost sharing. You can't meet the bronze level without that. That's a required federal provision. We don't have control of that. So adding value, I think, in the marketplace would be through some sort of cost sharing design, which I think it does apply to the consumer or the small business owner, would find is meaningfully different from the other plans and would give them another choice that they would prefer. So that's how I think about it. Again, it's not going to solve affordability issues because it's within this small context where we have some authority under the federal scheme. But it doesn't change the federal scheme. So that would be my answer. I would respond also that we struggled with that as we were uh, working through the, the descriptions of the criteria. And one of, we landed in a place where we wanted to keep it high level enough that the issuer, it's, on, it's the burden of the issuer to explain what's the value and to who. Um, that's very important, but um, these plans are being proposed and designed by the issuers who would want to need to answer that question based on their research and what they're hearing from their consumers. A concrete example from the 2012 process is 
that the carriers included wellness programs within the non-standard plans that were not included in the standard plan. So that was a design feature that they were arguing added value because it was a new type of program. Yeah, the public time. Yes, Kim. Yeah. Okay, we're also here. Um, I, I appreciate your evaluation criteria, and I think um, overall they make a lot of sense as far as adding value in uh, having a substantial difference in standard plans. So it's not duplicative. And I just wanted to suggest that perhaps in one more evaluation criteria should be um, a, a look at the overall number of plans so that, um, because I think. Uh, the more plans we get, the more overwhelming it is to consumers trying to pick a, a plan. And at some point, even if each plan is substantially different from the next, it's just it's just overwhelming. It, so you could fit all these criteria and end up with 100, still 100 different plans. And so it just seems like one other thing to consider is 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 it are we keeping to a a reasonable number of plans so that consumers aren't looking at 20 different plans when they're trying to decide what to pick. Thank you. Any other public comment? <laughs> Seeing none, I'd like to thank you. Okay. Oops, did I miss Okay. Thank you very thank you. much. Uh, at this point, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you and have a great rest of the day.